So believe it or not, I have had the chance to spend time with Gene Bellinger, and you can imagine what those Zoom calls are like one-on-one. <laughs> -on -one. Uh, but one time, we decided to see if we could map this thing out using his fancy things without his fancy icons. And what, what came up for us was that people flourish and people together create an emergent property we were calling generativity. Uh, but then we were like, well, how do people flourish? And our thoughts were, well, people flourish when they balance themselves across several domains of life. So are they um, spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally full, mentally flourishing? Are they economically flourishing? Um, and is the environment flourishing? So if we, if we have personal uniqueness and you could create a flourish o meter, because I like to create o meters, um, you know, maybe my mental flourishing o meter and intellectual flourishing is different than Peter's um, flourish o meter on that scale. Uh, but we are still getting to our personal uniqueness. And I always say, um, I would likely not be an NBA basketball player, no matter how I tried. There, I think, was one person, Spud Webb, who might have been shorter than me, or Bugsy Bogues, so it was maybe two, that have been shorter than me if I play NBA basketball and their vertical jumps a little better than probably mine would ever be. So I will not be an NBA player, but that's okay, because I don't have to be an NBA player. We don't all have to be the same. We don't all have to experience the same world. So what's interesting is that when you start to measure some of these ohmmeters, we have some we can easily measure, right? So we can measure our economic ohmmeter. Right? And we tend to overmeasure our economic ometer. And so you see, at least in the dynamics of much of the work going on in our economy, how do I optimize my economic value and maybe at the expense of one of my other uh, areas, which then doesn't make me really flourish because I am over damping one variable. Who is the? That's Ted, right? You're the, there's an answer and a variable. So. Um, so I'm over-optimizing on one thing, and then I'm not on the other. On top of it, we've learned how to transactionalize almost all those others. So I can buy emotional well-being and, and health, or try to at least. I can, I can go get liposuction, and, and maybe that's going to make my physical well-being or my perceived physical well-being better. Um, I might, you know, I might even buy my way spiritually especially in the 1500s with uh, indulgence. So, um, so there might be other, other issues here. So there's a, a guy who turned me down for speaking for free so he could go to the Montreal Jazz Festival and make like 40K, Douglas Rushkoff, today. So I, he sends his regrets, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but I talked to, to Douglas Rushkoff, and, and he wrote a book called Life, Inc. And what it really talked about is how the corporation conquered the world and how, how corporations were started. So, so I'm gonna, you know, we talked about drug dealing constitution signers. Um, do we, does anybody know how the, what the first corporations were about and why? Building the Panama Canal. Well, no, it was not building the Panama Canal. But the first, what happened was that in the Middle Ages, there was uh, a little bit of uh, movement of technologies and at the time, the Middle East had the bazaar. And the bazaar was a place where people could bring their own talents and skills and trade them on an open market. And that open market was not happening in feudal Europe. In feudal Europe, you were a serf, and there were the lords and the vassals, and you worked the land for them. And when the bazaar started to come into Europe, they're like, wait a minute, this is kind of changing my paradigm a little bit. Um, all of a sudden, now people have agency and I, as the king, don't really like that. Or I, as the lord, don't really like that. <clears throat> so, the people in power that were feeling a little bit in danger said, why don't we start up this concept called a chartered corporation? And so there were a few of them. One was called the Dutch East Indies Corp. And the Dutch East Indies Corp went to uh, India, right? Yeah, East Indies, yeah. Went to India. They went everywhere. But they went to India and they standardized rice production. 
And so people were making rice in the fields, but after that, you couldn't make rice. You had to send it into the corporation or market, and the corporation was the monopoly of the market. As a matter of fact, I think it's the same Dutch East India Company that the drug dealer, American Patriots, were fighting against because they had market power and you had to buy tea from the Dutch East India Company. So basically, corporations were built as a way to re-entrench power of those that were in power. And so it's interesting if you take the history of the corporation, and so you can go read the book, um, more and more focus has been on the accumulation of capital and not the flow of money. So we end up with corporations that take the capital. By the way, normally when they spend that capital, their return on capital is pretty poor. And a good time of, of thinking about that was in the 70s when all the corporations were doing conglomerates because they thought that economies of scale would work. But really what they did is they burned through capital because they didn't know how to use and spend capital while they just know how to acquire capital. Most of the value, if you want to call it value, in our markets now are in the derivatives market. So it's not about creating value at all, but it's creating a bet on a future on something that isn't really real and tangible so that people can acquire more and more and more. Um, who's that? John Toussaint. Milton Friedman. So Milton Friedman uh, came along, I think, in the 60s or maybe in the 50s. And, uh, and basically said that the purpose of a corporation is to create shareholder value and no more. And so we've been living in an environment where if you're a publicly traded corporation, that's your goal. And by the way, you're just going back to your roots because that was the goal of the original corporation. So, so somehow that didn't settle with me a while ago. And, and there's a book called The Living Company. Um, done by a guy at Royal Dutch Shell. Of course, they didn't really have a lot of market power, and that's just a joke. Um, but the living company said, there are companies, the average life, life of a company is about 40 some years. But some companies have lived 700. What's going on here? And why, are, why are, are companies dying so early? And so what he found in a lot of his work is that companies need to be adaptable, and companies need to work from whatever their problem is set here and then move to someplace else if they want to survive and if they care to survive. And there's something about survival and, and developing people and stuff in there too. But um, being at MIT and, and thinking about this, I started to say, well, well, if Maslow tried to create self-actualization of a person and if companies are living and they have purpose, they must be like people. So then can I create a Maslow's hierarchy, hierarchy of corporations? So back in 1997, said, well, if you have a value proposition, if you have a lean as an underlying thing, then you put system thinking in, you get people involved and engaged, and then you can self-actualize the community organization. Um, I was at GM at the time, so we were the 28th biggest country in the world from a GDP perspective, and the number one in revenue as a company. And so I felt like companies had to give more than just optimizing their profits, they're re res responsible for their employees, they're responsible for the, for the places that they actually work, and they should be responsible for the customers that they serve. So just a, a thought process there. So we talked a little bit about generativity, and, um, and I don't want to steal uh, Mike's model or thunder, um, but Mike, I, and Ted, and some others in the room, John and others, have been involved in trying to craft this, this model of generativity. So, so thinking of that, I think a unique potential, unique calling to you know, create some conditions that we've been talking about to enable flourishing people, flourishing um, environments. That takes me to like Toyota culture. So Toyota talked about in this book, and Mike Hoseas um, used to work in HR there, and I'm sure some of you guys know him and his work. Um, he talked about creating value for the customer normally doesn't create value for the person that's working for the customer. So if I'm, a, if I'm installing steering wheels on cars, and I have to install 337 of them on my shift, every time I do that, I'm, not, I'm giving value to the customer, because when we talk about it, the only time you give value is when that part actually gets assembled to the vehicle and someone gets the value of it. I get no value for the people. So how do people accrete value in a company? 
And so it's through their own learning, and I'm calling it flourishing. So I've been trying to stay away from growth because, as you saw in Gene Bellinger's unfettered growth model, does not is not going to work forever. But people can learn and become their full selves. And hopefully, I don't grow anymore because I'm not growing up. I would only be growing out. Um, the human value stream of employees approach proposes that employees gain value through their own learning and flourishing, and they can only do that by, in this case, the problem solving skill. So for Toyota. Value for the customer and no value for the employee. When I can't create value, that gives me an opportunity to work on a problem. I can use that problem solving to become a better person, to be more flourishing in myself. Now, there's other ways you can flourish, as we've been talking about, like U.S. synthetics. It's not just the problem solving angle, but maybe it's the problem solving angle towards community. So that leads me to Aikigai. So Aikigai is a Japanese word for a reason for being. So when you think of this, you can see four different Venn diagrams that come together in the middle to have one's reason for being. And that's, what are you good at? What do you love? What does the world need? And what can you get paid for? So for me, I, I feel like I'm primarily in delight and fullness, but no wealth at the moment. That's OK. Um, but the goal is, what are you good at? What are your skills? What are, the, what are the skills? What's that uniqueness? What's that acorn that you're up? What? Do you love? What do you love to do? If you know what you love to do and what you're good at, you can call that a passion. Right? What does the world need of you? What's your calling? What's that calling? What's that sun for you? And then what can you get paid for? So, so we start thinking about, wow, okay, how can we help people achieve their IQ guy? And can work do that? And this was not the slide I wanted. So this must be the kind of that work. Okay, so this is not my slide deck. So I'll go with this slide deck. Um, so what if generative business is a tool for really helping people achieve their flourishing? What if that's what business is for? What if it's just a tool? We've been using it as a way to accrete capital. We've been using it for a way for some people to make a heck of a lot of money and most people not to. Could we create a product or service as a means for people to learn and flourish? So what do you do with the profit? What can you do with the profit? Well, as Lynn knows from her statistical analysis, $18.19 in our area is our hypothesized living wage that allows people to stay financially not unstable. And if you ask Peter, he'd say about $23 allows them to stay stable. So it's somewhere in that range of not unstable to stable uh, as, a, as a wage. Um, can you, can you plow that extra value that the customers give you into people, not into profit? What if it's the very best in place for their development, discovery, and fullness? So for example, uh, Myron Construction in our area has got a dream manager. They actually have a person on staff that coaches you through your life to enable you to determine how you can achieve your dream. That's another thing. What if CEO salary did not exceed 10 times the lowest wage earner? I'll give you a couple other stats on what that looks like today, but they just there was just an announcement of the growth of CEO salaries over the, the last period of time. <clears throat> what if that structure of the business enabled the business not to be taken over, not to be used in a way where you need to get quarterly earnings? And what if it's structured using the Dunbar number? So anybody heard of the Dunbar number? The Dunbar number is, the, uh, is basically if you map brains and the complexity of the brain, it's how many different concurrent relationships can you manage in your brain. So humans, by definition, based on the size of the brain and the amount of connectivity, is about 150 people. You can manage the relationships of 150 different people and still be like a tribe and not end up with an HR department or end up with other departments that need to manage systems because they become too complex. So what if we spun off every business that would be 150 employees left? And what if it focused on regional footprint? So this would be an example of, boom, can you get hospitals, education, government, local SMEs? These are in, in people who care about their community. So if you care about your community and you're, and you're privately owned, um, or you're nonprofit, you're probably in the game to wanting your community to thrive. If you're 
um, a company that's publicly traded, you may want to, but it may be harder. But I would throw Oshkosh up there as a interesting example because they're very much about community, very much about um, their people, but there's a, a stress between if you lost the next business contract, what's going to happen and how can you hold that? Yeah. And how do you take out Syntas, Cisco, Sodexo, and Aramark? So those are four companies. You can use a model line to do it. Here are four companies. There's Syntas, Cisco, Sodexo, Aramark's revenue and their operating income a year. Uh, they throw off that amount of dividends. They throw off that amount of salaries to CEOs. And you can see the CEO ratio is not 10 to 1 to their lowest income person. It's 195 or 992 to 1 to their median or their middle income. So 1,000 to 1 value. I'm not sure if a CEO adds 1,000 to 1 value to their average employee. So places that want to want to imagine, places that want to create a shared vision, these might be places that want to want to develop systems or businesses that can allow their community to stay as a web of relationships to enable the profits of that to stay within the community. Laundry was one example. So uh, I've actually done a back of the envelope thing on laundry, um, which would be a Cintas, take out Cintas model. I presented this once at Cintas, and so then I used the Sodexo model. I didn't use the Cintas model, but in Cincinnati. But take out, how do you take out that, that corporate one where the CEO salary is going to Cincinnati? It's not staying in our environment. The dividends are going to the shareholders, not to the community. And um, understand the next step. You could think of a food system, and I know, uh, Monty, you've been looking at food systems. You know, are there ways to create local food chains, local food systems that allow for local generative local community things? So there's a couple slides here at the end, but Necessary Revolution talked about models of how to do sustainable business. Naturally Clean was seventh generation before I think they got bought up by venture capital to be flipped. Same with the uh, uh, your Keurig uh, company, right? Green Mountain Roasters was a local uh, coffee roaster, Keurig, and then Venture Cap, and now it's something different. Tattoos of the Heart, that's Gregory Boyle's work in LA where he's created businesses to work with gang members where compassion is really their main uh, purpose. So how are they I mean, ensuring gang members that used to fight each other side by side are working in the same cafe um, over in East LA. So that's another example. Um, I, had, I had an example of um, talking about everybody matters and so on and so forth um, in here as well as two others. Um, US Synthetics, kind of what you're doing, everybody matters, and a third, which I don't recall. And then last of all, um, there's a book like Completing Capitalism. So Mars Corporation, publicly traded, you probably eat M&Ms or anything like that. Um, they are asking, how much profit's too much? They noticed that they were making a lot of profit, and they were worried for two reasons, I think. I'm not sure which one's the benevolent part, which one isn't. But they were worried that their value trade chain might have some risk, that the person growing a coffee bean might be risk, at risk to actually being sustainable in creating a wage for them that works. So they, they took some of their profit and re-racked it into their supply chain. So not only does it create a stronger and more robust supply chain, but it also creates something where they say, you know, maybe, maybe we've got to do something different with all this profit because people really like our candy. It's another drug. Um, and then recently, um, there's been a group, kind of post-Milton Friedman capitalistic world, where maybe it's not just about shareholder value, but maybe it's about broader stakeholder value. And there's just a group, was it two weeks ago, John? That kind of set, set kind of a manifesto saying, hey, maybe we should be looking and focusing on things a little bit beyond what we're doing. So that's Norman Bodek. He, is, he was at SkillsFest 1 and 2 via video. Um, he actually has a webinar on this tomorrow at 1 o'clock. So if anybody's interested, um, I might just see if I can run the thing over at Catalysis after this uh, meeting. But a new corporate commitment to build a value customers, invest in employees, deal fairly and ethically with suppliers, and support communities where we work. And they're, they're looking for feedback, at least Norm Bodick is, so I don't know if he's writing another book, but um, he's, he's probably got a few more in him because he's only like 88. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, we'll on this tomorrow. So 
So in the end, you know, what can we do um, as a community, as people in business, to think about how we use business as a way to create generative um, local community and create uh, flourishing individuals uh, throughout the world?